I think that's a good question, and I don't know of any literature that clearly delineates how far you should get it across. I would say you'd like to get it across at least four or five centimeters uh, to get some amount of fixation uh, on the lateral aspect, but I don't know of any particular guidance in the literature uh, in that regard. So this is related to the last two questions. So you don't really get rigid fixation with this, and particularly you don't have any uh, rotational stability. So I'm wondering, do you change your post-operative protocol at all when you use these with uh, comparison to a plate? Do you restrict their motion any longer or keep them in a sling any longer? Typically, you're getting interdigitation of the fracture fragments with these, and in my experience, these have required open reduction through a small incision, so we actually uh, I haven't been able to get closed reductions on many cases, and I don't think it's a big deal to make a small incision. Then you can make sure that the rotation is actually perfect. There's interdigitation between the fracture fragments, and that gives you some amount of stability for rotational uh, control and motion. So uh, in most of the cases that I choose to use an intermedullary device, I can move the patient's active assisted forward elevation uh, right away. Next case is courtesy of Dr. Daphne Beingessner. Uh, I'll present this to Dr. Benershka. This is a 37-year-old male that presented after a bicycle crash. He was a veterinarian. He was uh, right-hand dominant, and this was his only injury. How would you approach this clinical scenario? Well, this really heralds back to the, the last case where you could envision getting uh, cortical interdigitation of the fracture fragments, that's not possible in this particular injury because there's segmental comminution in, in the intercalary segment. So the fixation that you are going to employ will have to bridge the comminuted segment. And you can see on the, uh, this intercalary zone, this fracture segmental injury here will require reestablishment to the near and far fragments. And to get this to be stably fixed, that requires loading that once it, it's connected. So whatever plate you're going to use may well require uh, a multiplanar approach, uh, ideally with the minimal amount of stripping. Obviously, this is a significantly displaced injury, so it will require um, a longer implant and uh, potentially a little bit stiffer implant, but it all depends on what you get in terms of the intrinsic stability intraoperatively. This is a, a reconstruction plate, so one of these heat annealed plates, so it, it's contourable for the front. But uh, you can also see that the intercalary zone has a series of smaller lag screws. Many of these can be placed under the plate that itself so that you can essentially reestablish a single bone, but then you actually bridge the fixation with the reconstruction plate and essentially allow, um, as you can see, a relatively long implant to control the entire aspect of the shoulder girdle. And that's what you really need to have in these injuries. If you have a very segmentally comminuted with um, bone loss, the reconstruction plate may be the one venue where you would want to consider a DCP, but most of these will be uh, accessible and treatable with a reconstruction plate. Um, in this case, this was done from the front. Let me ask a question again about hardware removal, so I'll perseverate on that. Winston uh, talked about removing a lot of the uh, IM nails because of a worry about hardware migration. How often in clinical reality do you have to take out plates because they're still prominent in the subcutaneous bone, Steve? That's a really good question, Jens, because the problem is that uh, there's been this move to treat these all uh, from the front because of the, once again, the plates being designed that to be allowed to be used that way, and the, the age-old, you can't put them on the top because of a backpack. That's true in certain parts of the shoulder, but I would say in our institution, very few of these are removed, and then when they are removed, you have to remember that you saw the surgical approach for all the nerves. When you're then going back through the scar to remove an implant that's prominent, it becomes potentially at risk for injuring those nerves if they haven't been injured in the index procedure or by the uh, initial trauma. So in general, we try to think about putting these implants in and not removing them and having them be as precisely contoured as possible to minimize their, their uh, tendency to be prominent. So this went on to primary bone healing and the patient had an excellent result. This next case is for Dr. Warm. Uh, it's a 26-year-old male who presented to him with this displaced fracture after a fall on a snowboard. He's a pretty active young guy and likes to lift weights. And this is his dominant extremity. So in this gentleman, we talked about uh, operative fixation versus non-operative fixation. He was very interested in getting back to full function as quickly as possible. 
And uh, our plan was to use an intermedullary device, uh, which is what we did. You can see the medial starting point on the upper left. And uh, we were unable to get a closed reduction. I think doing these, you should try one or two times to get a closed reduction utilizing a, a, a towel clamp <coughs> laterally or positioning the arm. We usually drape the arm free so that we can pull a little bit on the shoulder girdle. However, due to the fact that brachial plexus injuries have been reported, we're not overzealous in our attempts to do closed reductions, and we'll make a small open reduction whenever needed. That's what we did in this case, and we were able to get a good five or six centimeters of the three millimeter nail across the fracture site. So he really felt very good right after surgery. The fracture had a nice interdigitation at the time of surgery. You can still see uh, a small gap there and some callus formation since this is secondary bone healing. But he was relatively asymptomatic uh, immediately after surgery. And uh, one of the hardest things I have is slowing these patients down and asking them to t give the bone time to heal. By the time we saw him at 12 weeks, he'd already found his way back into the gym, was benching over 135 pounds, was doing sets of 50 push-ups. And uh, although you can still see uh, what appears to be a fracture line, he's clinically united and asymptomatic. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question to the panel. Uh, if you go back to the initial fracture x-ray, if this were your fracture, Winston or Steve or Pred, how would you choose to have this treated? You know, we're all not 26-year-old males, so I guess I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Um, do we really need to have 100% sh uh, shoulder abduction, 100% strength? I can see if you're a pitcher throwing a 95-mile-per-hour mile, mile fastball, it's more relevant. But at what point do you say non-operative treatment is adequate for this kind of patient, and what kind of patient is that? So I would say in a young patient with uh, uh, high demands on their upper extremity, in the fracture is displaced, I would recommend uh, fixation. If it was me personally, I would like to have my fracture plated. Uh, but yeah, I think the, what, what Steve's pointed out very nicely and, and Brett in the earlier reviews is this fracture with this amount of displacement is very prone to a non-union, which is going to have the person really laid up for a long period of time if they wait around for this to become a non-union six months later, you're still dealing with the same deformity and uh, weakness in the shoulder girdle and lack of ability to return to even daily functions. Uh, so I think you have to look at each person and each clavicle fracture individually and uh, talk to the patient and find out what they really want. And uh, patients that end up with non-unions are very often unhappy. And uh, even if they're not competitive athletes, I don't talk anyone into surgery, but I certainly give them the option of surgery. And I think you can use an intermediary device in certain instances where you have intrinsic fracture stability based on the lack of comminution. Steve, any thoughts? I think the main thing, the take home message is that classically, these are treated conservatively. We've become more aggressive in managing them by a number of means. Probably like many other bones that we used to think could be treated conservatively, the tibia is a good example. We almost always are treating tibia fractures operatively now because of the late sequelae to the ankle joint or the knee joint. Uh, I treated all the tibia fractures when I was in training conservatively, never operated on one that was acutely uh, injured. Whereas now we're much more aggressive in the management of these injuries because we're worried about the ultimate function 20, 30 years later. In the shoulder girdle, it's really no different. The, the major issue is, in a widely displaced fracture like this, I would think looking at this initial displacement, once again, that superior view kind of illustrates a shortening as well, that you would be considering some sort of fixation for this rather than conservative treatment because of the foreshortening of the shoulder girdle. And you can really ascertain that by looking at the frontal plane of the patient and how the shoulder is foreshortened. Um, and they are immediately more comfortable. The real question is, whatever you're choosing for your fixation construct needs to be stable enough or else you have to tailor the rehab protocol afterwards for the optimal recovery. Because if you're too aggressive in a, in a fracture that's not accurately or well fixed, it will lead to a failure fixation or instability, whether using intermedulate or plate fixation. So by a show of hands, who would want their clavicle, if this is your fracture, treated non-operatively? 
let the record reflect about uh, five or six. Who would want, I mean, this nail fixation was absolutely beautiful. Who would want a nail put in? Same number. And who would go for a plate? A slight majority. So we have a split in the audience also. <coughs> Very interesting. Uh, Corey? Uh, so I have two questions. Once the decision is made for open Russian internal fixation, could you dis, uh, discuss briefly the supine versus dinner chair versus beach chair, which was mentioned earlier in the talk, pros and cons of those positions, and also management of the supraclavicular nerves, uh, somewhat tenuous, and those nerves are often right in the plane of dissection. And I would be curious if you have had problems post-operative dysesthesias or neuromas uh, when those nerves are not actually sacrificed at the time of surgery. I think the big question, and you brought it out, is that good physical exam is very important. Many of these patients uh, will actually have avulsion of some of these nerves with a significant displacement uh, in the higher energy injuries, either from the direct blow or the, uh, the initial fracture displacement. So when you're doing the dissection for the surgical intervention, you'll actually not find some of these nerves in the process of your dissection because they may have well been avulsed. And these patients will end up with in infraclavicular numbness. And if you essentially go through this with a bovi and essentially take these down, they'll have a, quite a significant anesthetic area of the front of their shoulder. That may be a problem with respect to other types of activities afterwards. Uh, it doesn't necessarily affect the plexus. It's uh, primarily these uh, cutaneous nerves that you have to be careful of looking at. We, we've advocated doing more supine approaches largely because the radiographic evaluation is more uh, reliable. You can get intraoperative corroboration using a C-arm, which is very difficult to do with the beach chair position. Also, the weight of the arm is now negated, so you don't have the gravity effect of the arm, so that you can actually manipulate the fragment more precisely and perhaps have less traction on the, on the plexus doing it. Uh, I always draw the incision out if I'm doing anything to know where I would have to go in the bailout situation. So I would, if I'm going to do operative treatment and I'm thinking of a smaller incision with an intermediary device, I would make the incision where I would ultimately be able to extend it so I don't burn a bridge for a late, let's say it doesn't work the way I want it to. And that's really, I think you, that sort of goes on this preoperative planning idea. You don't go in with just a plate or just a nail. You go in with the opportunity to do whatever is necessary in the indication for the procedure. Okay, I think we have time for one more case. This was actually a case from this past weekend at Harborview. Dr. Uh, Bernerska was on call. It was a 24-year-old male who crashed his motorcycle into a tree. The impact was directly over his clavicle. He had a complete brachial plexopathy, uh, but no apparent vascular injury. This, this really illustrates the high energy nature of some of the injuries we're now seeing. This injury, uh, the patient was um, required conscious sedation uh, with intravenous uh, uh, medication just to keep him quiet in bed, even though he had a completely anesthetic arm. He w was very uncomfortable and on the ward. Uh, the, the patients basically needed a continuous IV sedation. Uh, he was taking the operating room for management of this, and you can sort of see the high energy nature of this. It almost came out the skin with the initial displacement, so you can imagine the kinetic energy that was dissipated in this shoulder. Uh, this just shows you the uh, approach that we made, and uh, I think there's a couple of slides kind of show these nerves. Uh, this is just uh, the deep dissection here. You see one of those nerves. It's right in the area where the fracture was reduced. You see we have a clamp across the fracture to interdigitate it. And then, as you can imagine, wherever you put the clamp is always where the lag screw needs to be. And unfortunately, that is exactly where the plate needs to be. So you have to work around that scenario. But what we many times will do is reduce the fracture then contour the plate morphology, get it to be appropriately positioned on either side. And much like any other plate fixation, when we apply it, you are working through the windows that are 